We're going to return to the theme of marriage again this morning. This is the second lesson. I'll have at least one more, maybe two more. But the, the passages we're looking at emphasizing Matthew 19, 1 through 9, Genesis 1 and 2, the verses in the chart up there, and then Ephesians 5, 22 through 23. I'm doing this because I've been asked to speak on marriage at a lectureship in Indiana in November, and they wanted the manuscript by July 1st. I've got that turned in. And I thought, I'll go ahead and preach these lessons here. That'll help me. And we need to, we need to have lessons on this. That the world does not understand marriage. And that is clear because of what the world has done with it. All the way back to, to the early days in Genesis, there was a man, he took two wives. Well, that wasn't what God's plan for marriage was. And today we have men taking men and women taking women in marriage. Marriage is of God. Now, a lot of people treat marriage kind of like they do. Well, well it's sort of like buying a car. You know, it's, you could put a lot of thought and work and get a car and you're proud of it. But that old car, it starts giving you problems. What do you do? Well, I'll get rid of that car and I'll give me another one. Well, that's the way some folks do their spouse. That husband, he starts giving me problems. I'll get rid of that husband. I'll get me another one. My wife's giving me problems. I'm going to get rid of her. I'll just get me another one. And they think they can do their marriage the way they do their automobile. It doesn't work that way. And it's so tight what God says about marriage is some of the apostles said, well, if this is the case, it'd be better not to get married. And Jesus agreed. There's some folks that just shouldn't get married. If you can't receive it, don't get married. Here's the question Jesus was asked. Is it lawful to put away his wife for every cause? Now, Jesus said no. And he addressed it again in 1 Corinthians 7, let not the wife depart from her husband. Well, what if she does? What if she divorces her husband and puts him away? Well, she's got two alternatives. Let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. Well, what if she takes a third alternative, says, no, I'm going to get another husband. What, is, what if she does that? Well, Romans 7, 3. If while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. And Jesus answered that question that way as well. Can a man put away his wife for every cause? Here's what Jesus said, Matthew 19 and verse 9. Whosoever shall put away his wife and shall marry another committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her that is put away commits adultery. Now, there is something left out there. You see those yellow slashes? There is an exception. There's one exception. Here it is. Let me put the exception in there. You see what it teaches, but here's the exception. Except it be for fornication. Now that's the exception. I like the way it's described where we can understand it, summarize it. It's one man and one woman joined together by one God to be one flesh for one life with one exception. There's the exception. Now, I'm going to review some things that we went over, and I've already done a little review. We went over in the last time we talked about this. But I want to make 12 observations on marriage uh, coming off of those passages from Matthew 19, Genesis 1 and 2, and Ephesians chapter, uh, chapter 5 there. Let's look at them. Here they are. Number one, marriage is of God. It has been from the beginning, and it's older than sin. I think it's significant that marriage is older than sin. There is a purity to marriage 
that has nothing to do with sin. It's older than sin. In Genesis 1.27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. And God is the one that created them, male and female. Genesis 2.18, the Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I'll make a help meet for him. And so we read in Matthew 19.4, Jesus pointed back to that. Is it lawful? for a man to put away his wife for every cause. Jesus said that's not how it was at the beginning. At the beginning, he made them male and female. And they said, well, what about Moses? Well, because of the hardness of your hearts, he suffered you to put away your wife. But from the beginning, it was not so. Marriage is of God from the beginning. Older than sin. All right, number two. Number two. In telling man and woman to be fruitful and multiply, God sanctioned their physical relationship. I'm going to use careful language here because of who all's in this audience, but you know what I'm talking about. God sanctioned that. He wouldn't have said this if he hadn't sanctioned that. In Genesis 1 and verse 28, God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the joy and pleasure, number three, the joy and pleasure of this physical relationship is God's blessing. It's God's gift to the married. You have uh, these uh, wedding showers, you know, where you receive all these gifts and you're going to have married, then you get all these gifts together and all. Well, when you're married, God gives you this gift. Here's your gift. This is my blessing for you. Look what he says. God blessed them. See, this is a blessing. God gave the married. He blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And that's what this is talking about. 1 Corinthians 7, 2, to avoid fornication. Let every man have his own wife and every woman have her own husband. Don't try to get somebody else's husband or somebody else's wife. That's not the blessing. You have your own. And Hebrews 13, 4, marriage is honorable in all. In the bed undefiled. That's God's blessing for us when we are married. That's his wedding gift to us. Number four. Because it was not good that man should be alone, God made a woman to be a helper suitable for him. That's the words in the King James Version, help meet and help me. That means she's going to help him and she is going to be a suitable help for him. Adam saw all the living things and nothing was really suitable for him. God, I, it's not good that man would be alone. There is a helper suitable for him. Now, I've heard that passage read. You may have heard it too. A help mate for him. Well, that's, uh, that's part of that, but there's much more to it than that. It's a help that is suit a helper that is suitable for him. That's what, that's what it, this is talking about here. Number four. Number five. Now, watch this. God put man in the garden. He put him in the garden to dress it and keep it. He's to dress and keep everything in the garden, isn't he? Then he put woman in the garden. Well, he's to dress and keep her. To nourish and cherish her. You see, in the garden, Adam was the husbandman. That's what you call a man that takes care of the farm and the, the animals and the plant. He's the husbandman. And the husbandman is to be the husband. That garden's going to thrive under his care. That's what it's going to do. 
And, and that would show the, a successful man. You put a man on a farm and look, look how prosperous and wonderful that farm is. It's so well kept. It's such a, and that farm is such a blessing to him. That's because he's taking care of that farm. Well, man's supposed to take care of his wife. And she will prosper under his care. Husbands, think about that. That's the, the principle by which you care for your wife. And she will bless you if you take care of her. To dress it and to keep it. Ephesians 5, uh, that's, uh, I think, 28 and 29. 28. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. No man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it. That's another way of saying to dress it and to keep it. To dress it. That doesn't mean you help her get, get her clothes on. That's not what. Now, it might mean you need to do that. But that's not what that's talking about. You, you've heard about dressing the... Uh, uh, dressing the plants in the garden, you're going to put fertilizer with it, aren't you? That's how you dress it, with fertilizer? Uh, why, why do you use a salad dressing? Well, you got to fix it up. Don't you add something to it? Fix it up, don't you? Well, you're to dress your wife. You are to provide for her what she needs so she can prosper. That's what a husband is to do. And then to keep it. That means you protect her. And that's what the words mean. Nourish and cherish. You see that idea of nourishment and nourish? Husbands, that's what you do. You dress your wife. You provide her the good nourishment she needs. It's not just food. She needs a lot more than, than that from you. She needs a companion. She needs sympathy. She needs understanding. You provide for her what she needs so she can prosper. And then you protect her. You keep her. When you cherish something, somebody ever had a, oh, I just cherish it, and they kind of hold it here. What are they doing? They're holding it here where it's safe. They love it. And that's what a husband does. That's what a husbandman does to his garden. That's what a husband does for his wife. He nourishes her and cherishes her. And we say it this way often. Uh, we don't say it as much as we used to. I grew up hearing this, that we, we provide and protect. The husband is the provider and the protector of his family. That's the man's job. And so that goes all the way back to the way God, God planned it from the beginning. Now, Number six, Adam said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Eve was different than anything else on that earth. We know how God made man. He made man out of the dust of the ground. Okay, he, here's, here's man. You know why? You know, when men get filthy, dirty, that's just kind of, there they are. They're the dust of the ground. That's what they made out of. He made man out of the dust of his ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. But now where did the woman come from? God took the rib from his side and from the rib made he a woman and brought her to the man. And so Adam says, now she's bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Go to Ephesians 5, 28 and 29 again. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. See how that ties right together? No man ever yet, uh, he, he that loveth his wife loveth himself. No man ever yet hated his own flesh. She's bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. Now, I'll show you the significance of that. Look, look at 1 Corinthians 7, 3, and 4. Let the husband render to the wife due malevolence, and wife also the wife to the husband. The wife not have power over her own body, but the husband... Likewise, the husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife. Did you realize that when you got married, you gave the power over your body to your spouse? And she gave the power over her body to you? You gave your flesh to each other is what you did. 
Matthew 19, 5 says this, Wherefore there are no more twain but one flesh. Now I want you to think about that. When you touch her hair, you're touching your hair. That's yours for you to touch. When you hold his hand, you're holding your hand because his hands are yours now. When you look into each other's eyes, you're seeing your eyes because you've given yourselves to each other. And so you care for one another. I mean, you're not out here alone anymore. You got someone looking after you the way you would look after you. And you're looking after someone the way you would look after you. You've given yourselves to each other. Let's go to the next one. We're halfway through. Number seven. Number seven. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife. Now I just quoted that. A lot of time I'm putting the principle up there in the scripture, but it's all together here. There is a natural affection between parents and children, isn't there? It's just there. It's there. Uh, that, that little child, that, that mother holds that little child. She loves that child. And the father loves his children. And children, they, they just, it's natural to love. It's unnatural not to. Then it's just a natural bond that is just given. And if that bond does not occur, something is, something's not natural about that. But what about a man and his wife and a woman and her husband? That love has the priority. Even over the love of a mother and a son, and the love between a daughter and a father is the love that occurs between a man. Now, it may not just come natural, but I'll tell you, that love has priority. And here's what happens. See, you, you don't choose your children. You just get them. And you love whatever you get. You just love them. You don't choose them. Now, I know in adoption you would. There might be some exception to that. But, but you don't choose your parents. Your parents, you just get them. You don't get to pick out who they are. You just arrive and there they are. And you love them. But you choose your spouse. And you're responsible for your choices. And so that's the love that God says has your priority to where you leave your father and mother and be joined unto your wife. Number eight, Jesus calls the marriage what God hath joined together. Now, I know the state is involved in that. All through history, society has been, uh, has said, we, we, this is so important to the well-being of our society. We want, we got a part of this. And so you go get a marriage license and, and a lot of states, it's not just anyone that can marry you. You've got to have someone the state approves to perform that ceremony. And, uh, and so there's a state involvement, but it's not the state that makes the marriage they'll recognize it it's what God hath joined together marriage is a sacred covenant it's not just an agreement between a man and a woman it's an agreement between a man and a woman and an agreement between both of them with God. You're entering into a covenant with God when you're entering into a marriage ceremony and you're telling God, I choose this person and I am going to be that person's spouse. God, and you will rule in my marriage. It will be what... God wants it to be. 
And I've made that covenant, not just with her. I've made that covenant with God. It's what God has joined together. We call it this. You remember the word? Holy matrimony. Why would we call it that? It's because God's involved in this. That's why Jesus said, what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Number nine, the wife is to submit herself to her husband. Now, the scriptures are not ambiguous about this. This doesn't fit maybe the, you know, a lot of people, well, that's not politically correct. I, I did perform a ceremony one time, marriage ceremony, and I went over the vows. You know, I was a young preacher, and this young lady wanted to marry this young fella, and, and they like us. Neither of them knew what they were doing. We never knew really what all we're getting into. So that, she looked at those vows, and she showed them to her friends, and she came back and said, my friends really like these vows, but, but they said, I'll take that part out about obeying him. Take, take the part out about obeying. I said, now, wait a minute. God tells, God's the one that puts that part in there. I said, look, if you're not ready to say, I will obey him, you're not ready to marry him. Well, she thought about that and decided she wanted it in there after all. Here's what it says. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Now, it's your own husband. This is not about demeaning women to men. That, that's not what this is. This is talking about a relationship between a wife and her husband. Okay? So, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. The husband is the head of the wife. It's like Christ is the head of the church and the church is subject to Christ. So let their wives be to their husbands in everything. Now husbands, I want you to watch this. What it does not say. It does not say husbands, make your wives submit. No. Husbands, you're out of this one. This is something the wife does as part of her submission to God. It's not because of you. It's because of God. If she says, I'm going to submit myself to my husband. Number 10. Husbands are to love their wives. Okay, husbands, look at this. Husbands, Love your wives. Did you see any ambiguity in that? I, there's not there. Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Look at that. Christ gave himself for his church. Now, we know that Christ died for his church. It was even an agonizing death he went to for his church. And a lot of times we read that and that's where we go. We go right to the death that he gave himself for it. So he died and the man will say, yeah, I'll die for my wife. And he doesn't really think he has to. You know, he's not, that probably won't come up, but I'll do that. I'd die for her. And that's pretty easy to say if you don't have to do it. But there's something else here. Before Jesus died for his church, he lived for his church. That's the reason he came. That's why he lived the way he did and did what he did. All the way to the death he lived for his church. And husbands, we don't just die for our wives. We live for them. See, men, when we get married, our, our life is not our own anymore. I'm going to live for her. She is my priority, not myself. She's not here just to make sure I get to live my life the way I want to. No, I have married her for her benefit and her sake, and I give my life up for her. That's what Jesus did for his church. And that's how husbands are to love their wives. Number 11. 
What's a woman really want? You've heard that question, you know, and people pop, well, what's a woman really want? Maybe some women don't really know what they want. Men can't figure it out, you know, but here's what, here's a wise statement that I read one time. What a woman really wants is a man that she admires to love her. That's what she wants. And then what does a man really want? Well, men, we can probably relate to this pretty easy. Men, what we really want is a woman we love to admire us. Women, don't belittle your husbands. Uh, he might take it. He might take it in good humor. He might, he might suffer through that for years. He doesn't want your belittlement. He wants your praise. He wants you to admire him. He'll be a good man if you do. He'll do all kinds of things to win that admiration because, because he loves you and he wants that admiration. Men, you be an admirable man so that she can rejoice in your love. She wants a man she admires to love her. And this is scriptural. Here's the passage right here. It's in Ephesians 5 and verse 33. Let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. You see that word reverence? That's what you do, women. And men, you'll make your wife the best wife she can possibly be by loving her. She will thrive on your love. And, and women, you'll make the best husband you can have by admiring him. And God has designed that where these things work together, don't they? Number 12 and this is where we'll bring this to a close. Number 12, we have two God-given models for marriage. The, the Bible teaches us what to do. Model number one was the one that existed before sin. It's in, it's in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. Go through and read those again and infer from that what was God's plan for marriage from the beginning. There's your model. Now you get into Genesis chapter 3 and it starts getting confusing because sin enters into the picture and the model begins to come apart. But Genesis 1 and 2 is the model. But then we also have the model in Ephesians 5, 22 through 20, uh, 33. And then 33, after Paul talks about all this on marriage, he said, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and His church. You see, you think about that relationship between Christ and His church, and you've got a model. Men, you are to be Christ-like to your wife. And women, you are to be church-like to your husband. And with these models, we can make the very best of our marriage. And if we will acknowledge God, marriage, if we will make our marriage fit these models, it will not only give you the grace of life, it will honor God. And it will attract people to God. And so that's what we want to do. That's how we honor God and that's how we love God. We obey His commandments. We do what He says. We be what He wants to be. And we make our marriage what God wants it to be. You need to honor God in your life. That requires submission unto Christ. And that means to repent and be baptized in the name of Christ and then to live that sanctified life. If you've fallen short of that, you can uh, fix that this morning and take care of that as we stand and sing our invitation song.